10,000 hours. They say it takes 10,000 hours to master your craft. So, you better get started. But you've been headed in this direction for quite some time now, haven't you? You see, you're one of those people chasing after that dream. With all the late nights, dead batteries, computer crashing, seven day weeks, overpacking, overflowing inbox. What day is it? Just one more take. Elevator pitches. Final Final version 23. Rendering. Early call times. Hard drive stacking up. Did I back this up? What feature was that again? One more coffee. Perfectionist. Hustler. Who just can't help but do what you do. You can't help yourself, can you? Can't help chasing. Can't help working on. That dream. Good evening. I'm Creve Stenders and welcome to the 2021 Sony Film Festival Awards. We bring you this ceremony from the traditional lands of the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation and pay respect to Elders past, present and future. We'd hoped to gather in person for this, the inaugural awards, but that just wasn't possible. Instead, we come together tonight across Australia and New Zealand to celebrate excellence in filmmaking. I've been in the film and television industry for over 30 years, and as director of films such as Red Dog, Danger Close and Slim and I, I've had the pleasure of working with extraordinary homegrown talent. In fact, Australia and New Zealand are renowned for their talent, both in front of and behind the camera, and it's through opportunities such as these awards that we can showcase it. As a technology leader with deep roots in the global film and television industry, Sony is proud to present the Sony Film Festival Awards. It's now my pleasure to introduce the Managing Director of Sony Australia and New Zealand, Yuso Otsuki. Thank you, Cliff. And good evening. Welcome to the Sony Film Festival. Sony has very clear corporate purpose, which is to fill the world with emotion through the power of creativity and technology. The reason we decided to start this film festival is exactly following this purpose. We want to encourage the creativity of all the filmmakers across Australia to the New Zealand, together with Sony's technology to shoot brilliant films. Actually, there are so many great films entered this film festival. Tonight, we're gonna celebrate all the hard works of creators, their storytelling, and the inspiration. When you watch these films, if you move your emotion, through the power of creativity and the technology. That is the purpose of this film festival. I hope you'll be moved tonight. Please enjoy first ever Sony Film Festival. Thank you very much. One of my most profound childhood memories was seeing Jaws at the George Cinema in Brisbane. I was electrified by Spielberg's filmmaking and that's where my love affair with film took hold. I just said, I decided that being a filmmaker was exactly what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. So I went on to film school where I was exposed to incredible filmmakers and built a network of peers. I learned to pick up the camera, shoot, edit, make mistakes and make discoveries. I realised that the only way to make films or to learn about making films was by making them. Long before I made my first feature, I cut my teeth with short films and music videos. And tonight's awards celebrate the best short form filmmaking shot on Sony cameras across Australia and New Zealand. Filmmaking technology has never been more exciting and has never been more accessible. It means you can tell your own stories and find your own voice. This festival aims to encourage filmmakers at all levels, from passionate amateurs to industry veterans, to showcase their voice and their talent. The response was huge and the competition was tough. But the judges this year were impressed by filmmakers who told moving stories with mastery of cinematography, sound design and art direction. 
The winners all excelled in all of these areas, be it best fiction film, best non-fiction film, or best music video, which is our first award this evening. Music videos first appeared in the 1920s as short musical films. They amplified the story of a song with moving images. That purpose remains the same today, sometimes working in harmony with story, sometimes finding an abstract approach. Let's take a look at the finalists. A music video capturing the power underlying Nali and JK47 switching vocals. Filmed on Bundjalung, Widjabal country, the video centres itself around different tribes coming together and the special connection that underlays it, as shown by ceremonial dances and performances littered amongst natural shots that emphasise the connection of the land underneath it. It's also shown by featuring Nali's own cousin in the music video as the dancer, his cousin of Widjabal descent, coming together with Nali of Yegel descent for this common artistic thread. This music video uses a song written by music artist Pika Ocho about his mother, Sina, a migrant from Samoa who settled in Auckland, New Zealand to start a new life for her two sons and husband. A true story about his mother's life that was suddenly turned upside down when she realises the husband she loved and adored turns out to be a narcissist and her abuser in a domestic violence relationship. Buried in the sand and a long way from home, an astronaut emerges on an alien desert planet. Lost, confused, and before he can get his bearings, a nuclear explosion throws him into a sandstorm from which he must now escape. With the planet obliterating itself into dust around him, he does the only thing he can do, run. An extended metaphor for chasing success against the clock, a storm's clarity explores the grit and determination it takes to make your dreams a reality and ascend into greatness. follows a group of people still looking to relive memories from their life they miss in their heart or feel they missed immersing themselves in. Through their visions, we find ourselves traveling back in time to see these special moments they yearn to be in. As we enter the world of memory projections via a lab experiment, we find that the laboratory assistants have also followed them down into this dream state as memory hitchhikers in order to reconnect memory projections of their own.
A young boy and a girl meet on the street. One has a lemonade stand and one has a juice stand. On this hot summer's day, who will sell more? Is winning more important than making a friend? As kids, we had an innate competitive nature inside us. We liked to win, we liked to be recognised, we liked being rewarded. And at the heart of our childhood, we liked making friends. Friendship can grow from the most simplest of gestures. For instance, a little girl sharing her fruit juice to help sell a boy's lemonade. Go get your own, Mr. Steal My Drain. Don't steal my drink. Get your own, my daddy made my sugar levels high. That's all right. Cause you're feeling like an alcoholic at the wrong time. Tell me if it's all right. Wow, great standard of work there across the board. Um, okay, well, the runner-up for the best music video is... End versus A Storm's Clarity. And the winner is... Dearest Madeline. Here to accept the award is producer, director and writer, Peter Tachawe. Congratulations, Peter. Would you like to say a few words? Um, I'm just going to swap it. I wasn't really expecting it. I was just like, uh, I was just like, Here's what the judges at Sony Music had to say. Dearest Madeline was chosen for its combination of emotive storytelling and themes, lighting and sound design. All artists should be incredibly proud of their work and Sony Music looks forward to seeing tonight's filmmakers evolve over time. Congratulations again to our winner, Dearest Madeline. We also want to hear which films and music videos you love from the Sony Film Festival. You can let us know your favourites by voting in the People's Choice Awards at the end of tonight's show. Simply follow the link in the description below and have your say. We live in a time when now, more than ever, all of us need to understand the importance of what is real and what is fact. That's why non-fiction filmmakers play such a vital role in our lives. Their storytelling helps shape our understanding of the world. Here are the finalists for the best non-fiction film. This short documentary follows Yemi Penn's experience of childhood abuse into adulthood and is integrated with the knowledge and insight of leading therapists and healers. Is there hope in venturing into the deep recesses of our pain? Yemi investigates whether she had to go through that experience to become the woman she is today. The confrontational question that drives the documentary is can the journey to healing our trauma act as a catalyst for transformation, growth and contribution? I, I definitely avoided acknowledging that trauma had happened to me. So between the age of seven, eight to about my thirties, I would have gone on my life as normal. I don't know, all these things went in my head. So even though I didn't feel it held me down, I think it did, it, it, ca it changed my self-worth. Subconsciously, even though I come from a culture that's all about strength and warriors and, and all of that, and we are resilient people, there was still something about my lack of self-worth. There are an estimated 200,000 Nepali women and girls who are trafficked to Indian brothels each year. Most of these young women are taken from the small villages. Women are also expected to marry from the age of 13, work on the in-laws' farms and start a family. Their choice of an education is non-existent as the expectation of women being a slave to the family has been part of the Nepalese culture for centuries. Women Take on Nepal takes you on a journey of three young, strong, resilient women who have fought the odds of being a female in Nepal 
through their determination to empower other Nepalese women through trekking in the Himalayas, which is frowned upon by the Nepalese trekking community. It shares the stories of trekking company Take On Nepal founders Som Tamang and Susan DeWitt's purpose behind their passion to provide the freedom for the girls from Patasi village. Why is this important for girls? Why is it important as females at this? Because in Nepal, you know, Nepali, pe Nepali people think girls cannot do the, what boys do. So that's why we want to do and we want to show and then we want to increase it. The girls can do everything what the boys can do. But we will prove it. It's good. Yes! We can do it! Yes! Stu is a gentle soul who lives with dozens of pigs that he calls his mates. He wants a simple life on his family farm, but it's not easy. The farm is in the middle of pig hunting territory, and Stu is forced to defend his pigs and his way of life. The family farm is slowly falling down around Stu as he struggles to keep his beloved pigs outside of his home. Sheds, cars, and even entire houses become derelict as the pigs move in. Stu, however, has inadvertently become an icon and a visitor attraction in the area. The public attention helps him stay buoyant and positive amidst what is surely an uncertain future for him and the pigs. This is the old homestead that was brought up as a kid. This is the hallway. Dad bought the farm way back in 1954 and been here ever since. And then in 2005, I took the pigs over and been, they become pets, been pets ever since. I had the pigs living them with me, probably as you can see from the mess. <laughs> Would have rather stayed in the old house, I love the old house. More room, and more pigs inside. The Fate of Giants is a mix of storytelling and natural history narration about the giant cowrie trees of New Zealand. The beautiful camera work and stunning musical score combine to tell the story of these forest giants from tiny seed to one of the largest living organisms on Earth. But their future hangs in the balance as cowrie dieback disease threatens these magnificent forests. However, not only the forests are at stake, it is also Maori culture which connects family lineage to these trees. If the trees go, it is like losing a family member. In this film, we learn that the forest is intrinsic to us, and to save it, we must respect it. The waters of Antarctica are some of the most pristine wilderness on Earth. All life here relies solely on the bounty of the Southern Ocean. Bold moves are being made to give conservation protection to this important Earth ecosystem. However, as we give protection to large remote areas of the ocean, it makes us realise that our coastlines close to home also need protection in order to sustain life on Earth. This short film is a poetic natural history documentary that looks at the animals and environments of the Ross Sea and sub-Antarctic islands. It carefully places the viewer amongst the animals and on the water to get a sense of its fragility and utter uniqueness. The waters of the Ross Sea region support an intact trophic web, cascading energy throughout the planet an unbroken food chain, helping generate life itself. Wow, again, really beautiful work. Okay, so the runner-up for best non-fiction film is... Antarctic Waters. And the winner is Women Take On Nepal.
Here to accept the award is the film's director, producer and cinematographer, Tanya Verbeek. <laughs> I hope I said that right. Yeah, you did, you did. How are you feeling, Tanya? Uh, I am absolutely shocked at this. This is absolutely amazing, not just for myself, but for the girls over there. They would be absolutely stoked. Um, yeah, it's amazing. Amazing. The judge for this award, Peter James, had this to say about your film. The film is a huge undertaking under very difficult, high-altitude conditions. It is so well covered with lots of camera angles and excellent shots where you really get to meet and understand these women. It is a very passionate and moving film, very well told. You gutsy girls. Okay, yeah, so the, the story is incredibly beautifully captured. I mean, wh where, did you get, where, where did you get the idea to document these remarkable women? Um, like, what was your motivation? Uh, we've got an amazing uh, guy called Som Tameng that lives in Cairns and his partner, um, who I was introduced to and he told me about a story of uh, running an orphanage in his village in Nepal, so it started off from there. But then I heard about them um, being trekking guides in Nepal, uh, so I, I took the challenge of doing Everest Base Camp, thinking I wouldn't be able to accomplish it, uh, but their story was just so incredible that that was motivating enough to get up there and film this whole story to tell the world, and it's, yeah, I'm just so proud of those girls and, and what they've been able to accomplish. You follow these women to base camp on Mount Everest, which in itself is achievement of its own, let alone whilst carrying and filming um, with all that gear. Can you tell us a bit about that experience? Yeah, it's um, it's not easy, I'll tell you that much. It was certainly a struggle. It was a 20 kilogram bag, um, but like I said, it was the, the story that kept us going. And uh, when you listen to their backgrounds, I think a challenge of just trying to beat altitude sickness is nothing in comparison to what they've been through. It was cold, it was minus 30 degrees, so I thought the camera gear might struggle a bit, but it, it nailed it. I only went through two, two batteries over the whole 12 days. Um, but yeah, it was, there were a few incidences with uh, the equipment, um, but it was able to, to nail it by the end of it. So no, it was good, it was good. The narrative of your film follows two or three women. Um, had you planned that from the start? Originally, it was one girl, Carmela, who's um, one of the girls in the documentary. Um, and then, yeah, it went to the three of them, just to, just how empowering. I mean, I'm going to be honest, there was, you know, four or five of the girls that were really incredible, um, but there's only a certain amount of time you can tell a story. But if you heard all their stories, you'd be absolutely blown away. It's, this is a short story of what a big story, um, of a bigger story that needs to be told. So hopefully I can get out there and tell the second part of this story. A camera can change people's behaviour. Um, like, how did you get the women to feel comfortable being interviewed? Uh, I was lucky enough to meet them in May the year before to kind of build some rapport with them. So as soon as they saw that first kind of initial um, video work that I'd done, they, would, they trusted the process. And so when I went out there, uh, it didn't take much for them to, to really trust what content I would create and what story I'd, you know, be able to tell the world. So yeah, that, that's what it, I think it was just the pre pre um, visit that I did before I went and did Everest Space Camp. Great, good on you. Okay, <laughs> congratulations again to our winner, Women Take On Nepal. And all of tonight's winning films will be screened at the end of the ceremony. Be it drama or comedy, Fiction transports us to another world. Fictional films not only move and entertain us, they also showcase the diversity in our community, invigorate our imagination, and sometimes inspire change. Here are the finalists for Best Fiction Film. A woman is in a test to join an esoteric order. It's an order that bends the conventions of physics. As a result, she falls through time and space battling her assessor. To join the order, she discovers she has to win. To do this, she must ultimately create and control the rules.
Drip is a harrowing thriller that follows a young woman on her first night alone in a new house. As the evening progresses, her hopes for a relaxing night at home soon turn into a nightmarish fight to survive, as a persistently dripping tap becomes an omen for something much, much more insidious. Detective Carver sits down to question Mason Fletcher, a career criminal and junkie he suspects is responsible for the kidnapping of a young child named Christopher. Carver works Fletcher from multiple angles, and Fletcher looks like he's beginning to cave as Carver reminds him that he can get the information he seeks from Fletcher's many associates. Fletcher, sensing his time is running out, finally begins to talk. But what he reveals is a dark and disturbing story from his past. A story that leaves Carver with more questions than answers. Why would anyone want to kidnap a kid? The kid has lots of uses. What are you saying? Well... My daddy didn't have a job. And he didn't have any money. But he did have a son that would do anything for him. Bama, meaning community in the language of the Duru people, is a poetic drama that follows a young Aboriginal boy who has moved far away from his family to go to private school. As he stumbles his way through the city, he is faced with the fear of losing the magic that holds him to his family. He runs from the city to one place he knows, the ocean, on his way reminiscing on the simpler times with his family, slowly realising that fear is what carries them with him wherever he may go. I miss my culture. Even though I didn't want to do it. I knew it was good for me. I don't want to lose that. This place just doesn't have it. While waiting for her beloved Brad to arrive home late from work, Sarah spends her night the only way she knows how. From tedious household chores that are undone moments later, to spontaneous dance numbers and movie reenactments in front of the mirror, finally ending her night with some well-earned pampering. It's an uneventful night of boredom and procrastination while waiting to give her darling man a late night surprise. Hi. I missed you today. Oh no, I just hung out. Brad, I should have told you sooner. We're having a baby. <laughs> Sandy! Tell me about it, stud. Wow, some stiff competition there. Okay, so uh, this year's runner-up for best fiction film is... A Theory of Incompleteness. And the winner is... While the Cat's Away. Here to accept the award is director and writer Aaron Carroll. Congratulations, Aaron. I'm sure there are some people you'd like to thank. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, 
Uh, lots of people. Uh, Carrie Ed Wallace, uh, Cecilia Lowe, Cameron Zayek, Davin Skargetta, Andrew of All Boys, uh, Leah O'Born, Branko Grabovich, uh, Bruce Armstrong, Aidan Ramsey, Philip Carroll, Sean McGlynn, Scott Poe, Mickey Semen, Gevajus, Scott Gaines, Andrew Doak, Deb Fabrice, Jess Jenkins, Tim Whiting, Zach McSweeney, Ed Reese, Benny Knopf, Will Gunn, and Dave Christensen. And all the other films that uh, were nominated, the sensational films. <laughs> That's a long list. We almost had to start running the music. <laughs> anyway, great. Um, look, uh, our head judge for the fiction category, Will Gluck, was inspired by the visual style of your film. The unpredictability and narrative was compelling and kept him guessing until the very end. Okay, look, this is such a well thought out film, Aaron. Um, every bit of the story is well paced and well executed. Uh, the obvious question, did you storyboard it? Uh, yeah, heavily, heavily storyboarded with my uh, DOP Cameron Zayek. Um, I just wanted to make sure that everything was uh, everything was planned out ahead of, ahead of time, and then that we knew exactly what we were shooting and just shot as efficiently as possible. So you had a fairly um, you had a fairly intensive post production process or pre production process. Sorry. Uh, I mean, yeah, as yeah, kind of. I mean, really, it was. It's just all kind of done out of boredom, really. I was waiting on a, the, my post-production, my previous film, Harvey, and I just kind of got a little bit bored. I already had the film in my head. It was actually a, a, a remake of a, of a film that I had made with Davin Scargetta in, um, in 2012 for, for Trotfest, and I, I kind of wanted to remake it because that was you know, a little, uh, more of a camera test uh, back then. Um, and, yeah, I just already had the vision in my head. We already kind of had it sort of a, a framework for, for what we'd already, already shot and yeah, we just kind of went from there. There are so many setups in the house. Um, you know, how long did it take you to make the film to actually shoot it? Uh, we, we hired an Airbnb for three nights uh, and we shot over two of those nights. And then there was a pickup uh, in Cam uh, garage, actually, and that was the the hand going into the uh, into the that you see at the beginning um, in, into the water and the little kind of cheeky turn that uh, Sarah does just before the dance sequence. The film was captured on uh, the Sony Venice. Was there a specific reason you turned to the Venice? Yeah, originally we were going to shoot on a red, but. Um, my, my DP Cam was really keen on, on trying the Venice that had just come out at the time. Uh, and we, we had some interior, interior shots inside of a wardrobe that was going to take quite a long time to, to, uh, to, to, to kind of get over the line, really. And using the, the Rialto head with the Venice was, was really helpful in that. Um, that was his reason, but I think it was also because it was being used on Top Gun too. <laughs> good, good answer. I'm sure Sony will be happy with that. <laughs> okay, um, look, the film ends with a with a really great, fantastic twist. Um, how did you come up with that? <laughs> uh, that was that was originally in um, in the original uh, incarnation, uh, incarnation of the the film for, for Trot Fest that we had made. Uh, it was. It, it was a lot more kind of subtle uh, in, in the end. Um, uh, Cam and I, when we were storyboarding, just kind of came up with the idea of of that ending. I don't want to give away the ending. We'll see it a little bit later, but um, just kind of making it a little bit more subtle and just kind of leaving it to the audience is, uh, is, is what we, we left it up to. Yeah, it's a really cool ending. I really, I, I wasn't expecting it. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> so congratulations again to Aaron and the cast and crew. And now I'll call out to any film school students out there who have been watching the show tonight. Um, Sony, in participation with the Australian Academy of Cinema and Television Arts, is excited to launch a new national short film, short film pitching competition. Sony hopes to uncover Australia's rising stars in cinema and filmmaking by giving students a chance to produce their dream short. Entries are now open and you can find the full details by clicking on the link description field below.
Whilst tonight's formal proceedings are drawing to a close, please make sure you stick around to watch the three winning films and have a chat with the filmmakers online. And don't forget to vote for your favourite. To have your say in the People's Choice Award and a chance to win a pair of Sony headphones, please follow the link in the description below. Before I sign off, Sony would like to thank everyone who helped get this film festival off to such a phenomenal start. Our esteemed judges, Will Gluck, Peter James and Sony Music Australia, to Sony Pictures Releasing and the Australian Cinematographers Society, and last but by no means least, a huge thank you to everyone who entered the competition or who worked on a film. Filmmaking is a team sport, a symphony of talents, of many talents, and this festival would not happen without you. We are so excited to come back next year, bigger and bolder, with the 2022 Sony Film Festival. Submissions open in February. So if you have a good story you want to tell, even if you've never made a film before, get cracking. And don't let anyone tell you what you can and can't do. In the words of the great Slim Dusty, you've got to run your own race. I'm Creve Stenders, good night and good luck. Starting never ends. Every new day, you look at familiar sights and see them for the very first time. Each new night, you're born again under an infinite sky. There are endless ways of seeing what was always there. New faces, new trends, new sensations. New angles, new forms, redrawn with every glance. New textures and new stories, just waiting to be shaped, to share and to inspire. Adventures are waiting. From the ocean to the earth, forward into the great unknown, or into your own backyard. It's never too late to start something new. Beginner or master, this is your chance to set hearts racing. So get out there. And start starting. Mr. Pop. Eat. Boy, I tried so many times to take you back. How many times can you apologize to me, baby? Here is Madeline, I'm searching to find the right words to say. Can we take some time to sit down and find why I'm feeling this way? To see these tears of words and my heart can't turn into something, something to say. I want to tell you this, but I don't have the heart for it. It will break everything that we made. Oh, tell me what to say, what to do, how to pray so that I'm good to you. My unfaithfulness shouldn't be every day. Well, I'm married to pray. So will you take the hand of a desperate man who was willing Willing to pay I'll change, I'll work I'll put God first I'm begging you to please stay oh, Boy, no I tried way. so many times to take you back How many times can you apologize to me, baby? You say you're gonna change But things remain the same, boy I can't keep hurting like this I gotta leave but you're telling me to stay, baby I gotta go, boy, I'ma walk away I done gave you all the 
chances with my love, you took advantage. Boy, you can no longer have it your way. So I can't tell you what to say, what to do, and how to play. Boy, you gon' have to learn the hard way. Your actions don't add up to your words, I've had enough. So you gon' have to find some other to play again. I made and you forget though My word been like Play-Doh You stay strong on your own Even though you know Even, even though you know, know they don't. don't But let's forget what they on We on another path I threw that shit a mile and you kept on running back. Proof of the strength on your back. Weight of the world on your shoulder and still you muscle there. I see you hustling. You want another man? Well, I understand. This ain't treat you right. It's the plight of a man who never changed. What he did from what he saw in his old life. And yeah, it's all mine. Focus, I ain't changed this thing. But you forgave amazingly. Wish I could erase those things. But scars are real and plain to see. But change gon' come and I wish you the best. To those that enjoy reap fruit that are blessed. Fruit that are blessed. So I can't take you back just cause you're begging me, babe. No matter how many times you're gonna say, you're gonna change, you're gonna work, you're gonna put God first. Cause even if I say it, it ain't gonna be the same. Came here because. Cause I need help. Uh, yeah. Nepal is a landlocked country between China and the India. So we have a, no option, you know. So we need to listen both of the country. So we want to be like a very good uh, friendship, you know, both of country, but uh, it's not reality you know they they look very smile and talk nicely but inside of heart is very polluted you know because of the women are very kind heart you know very kind heart and they are under educated and they they trust you know very easily you know they make the duplicate marriage and then after that uh, they bring to India and they sell the women uh, in a prostitute area in India. It's very sad and many our Tamang people are more undereducated, you know, because of the financially very poor family and they have uh, no chance to go to school, you know. When I first visited Nepal 11 years ago, what really struck me when I went to my partner's village of Batasi was just how 
poor the women are and how uneducated they were and how little opportunities they had. My name is Susan Devitt. I'm the co-founder of Take On Nepal along with my partner Sam Tamang. I'm also on the committee of Friends of Himalayan Children in Australia. I remember visiting the school in Batasse village and being shocked to discover that there were only four girls going to the school. Um, the rest of the girls I could see were looking after their younger siblings or helping out on their parents' farm. Um, this was something so alien to me. I had come from a culture where education was a given. We always attended school and we were given equal rights with our education. My partner Sam also spoke in length to me about the issue of human trafficking. So many girls from his village, because of its close enough proximity to Kathmandu, are trafficked out of the village um, with the promise of earning a good income, but they end up in the brothels in India. Now this has happened to many young women in my partner's village. So it struck me that this is an issue that we needed to deal with. And it was something that's very close to Sam's heart. So about 12 years ago, Sam started the not-for-profit organisation Friends of Himalayan Children um, with the mission of empowering young people and women um, through education and opportunity. So this charity work meant building a library at the school, building classrooms onto the school, employing school children. It led to the building of a hostel in his village which has become home to children who were not safe at home, whose parents may have left or whose parents had passed away, but it became a place where these young people could get the education that they deserved. And the level of education being received at the school was improved as well. Um, Friends of Himalayan Children worked hard to increase uh, the schooling level up to grade 10. Now that was a massive achievement for the village and it meant that the young boys and girls were not having to leave the village at a very young age. But as the years ticked by, these young girls that we had been educating were growing up. So they were finishing their education in Kathmandu. And then we wondered what next. Educating them so much is not enough uh, because we know that they're at risk of getting married at a very young age, which inevitably leads to having a family. And in Nepal, when a young girl gets married, the expectation is that they go to their in-law's uh, home where they're sort of become enslaved in their in-law's uh, farm and they just work hard and that becomes their life. So we didn't want to stop that, but we wanted to offer choices to young girls, which they just didn't have then. And what we needed to do was to be able to create something for them to do once they had finished their education. So Sam is a trekking guide. That's what he did before he came to Australia. Stephen and Cody from America. This is the other side, Makala region, and we're reason as well. He started out as a porter and then it went into guiding. He's very passionate about that. He loves the mountains. So it made sense that we would start Take on Nepal, which is a trekking company. Okay, guys, follow me. Um, but we started Take on Nepal with the aim of educating and training and employing these young people that we had been supporting through the charity. And also, with the aim of employing and training young women, which is absolutely unheard of in Nepal. Yes, excited, exciting. <laughs> Nepal is a naturally beautiful country, but there are so many problems like gender equality, uh, in Nepal, they don't give the same opportunity for the women compared to the men. Every people in Nepal, they believe that women cannot work as a man. We are not uh, strong as a man. There are 
so many women who haven't got uh, education and they have to work in the uh, field, they have to work for farming and they have children and they have to look after their, their families because of education and because of gender equality. But for me, and we take on Nepal, like my sister Kamala, uh, I work with Take on Nepal to be to to build up the women empowerment in my community. So, uh, Take on Nepal is uh, supporting for all the women from Nepal who wants to be independent and empowerment as a woman. Now, this faced a lot of resistance. People believed that it couldn't be possible, that it wouldn't happen. And it took a long time to be able to convince the parents of these young women that it's okay, that they will do well, that they're able for it. And we know that they're strong enough because we've seen them working on the farms and carrying up to 50 kilograms of firewood and bricks. So they are very strong and incredibly resilient. And we believed in them and we wanted to provide opportunities for them. So Take on Nepal was really born out of the need to provide something more for these young people who had been educated through Friends of Himalayan Children. My name is Samjana Tamang. I'm 23 years old. I'm very, very happy in this company. Um, it's 20 time. So Samjana here is one of our strongest female leaders on the trails. As you've just heard, she's done it 20 times. And for us who are doing it, many of you for the first time, I'm sure it's hard to even imagine. But when Samjana first started on the trails, she was faced with many difficulties. Some of the trekking lodge owners didn't want to have female guides staying there. They would say that Sanjana should be married and should be at home looking after her family. So it was a big struggle to begin with. And that was the case with most of our female guides. And um, so by Sanjana being employed through Take on Nepal, she's, as you heard, supporting her younger brother. Um, and she is the main breadwinner of the family. People say that ladies is not good for trekking and then no, he's strong. Why is this important for girls? Why is it important as females? That this... Because in Nepal, you know, Nepali, pe Nepali people think girls cannot do the what boys do. So that's why we want to do and we want to show and then we want to increase it. The girls can do everything what the boys can do. But we will prove it. It's good. Yes, we can do it. Yes. <laughs> Namaste, my name is Kamala. I'm, I'm 19 years old. I come from Patase when I was a child, like three, uh, four, five years old. That time my mother killed my dad and then I stay with my grandma. When I, my grandma left us, she died and uh, I live with uh, uh, my uncle, auntie, and I study in here up to 10 class, and then I shift in Kathmandu for my, continue my study. Drink your water as much as you can in Himalaya. It helps you a lot. Here's the key for Himalaya. I want to help some, and I want to trekking, and I want to protect the girls educated and uh, be able to, um, they uh, can stand their own. Yeah, I mean, independent, yeah. This year I'm gonna come here yes. for training, climbing training. Yeah, with me and one of the, our uh, team member girls, we're climbing here. So Kumbu Climbing Center is run by the Conrad Anchor. Uh, he's helping for uh, the Nepali people to, to be the professional 
ice climber in the future. Yesterday, during our Everest trekking, uh, we got a call from Dinesh, and he says we got sponsored by Not Face. That's an amazing opportunity. I'm very, very excited. This this project, I've been talking with the North Face and Jenny Low Anchor, who is founder of the Kumbu Climbing Center and uh, wife of Conrad. But I was looking for the girls who has a uh, really passion and determined what they want to do and very hardworking. So, so I miss Kamala and Fulmaya and some other more other girls who has really interest, passion, and really focus on what they want to do. So then I keep looking for them. Like I heard about them, then I have been looking for them. Where are they been? So finally I found them and I'm meeting person today here. And uh, I'm definitely there. Very, looks very passionate about what they want to do. And they want to do something which I can see in their faces. Uh, yay! Yay, girls! How do you feel? I'm very happy. I can't express with the wo words. This is so amazing to get a sponsor from North Face. I would like to say thank you so much. I'm very excited. Why do you have to train here? What do you, what's your future plan? Because I want to climb the mountain. Which mountain? Which mountain? Yeah. I want to climb uh, peaks, um, like Iceland peaks, Mera peaks, or um, Labuja peak, Tabuja peak. After that, I will climb all the rest. My name is Fulmaya. I'm from Nepal. All I want is freedom and independence as a woman. So, let's do the trek to the Himalayas. Yeah. Come on, everybody. So we have been here for 12 days to do Everest Base Camp trekking. This is women only group uh, trekking uh, to the base camp. During the trekking, all the women were so energetic and happy, and they were always smiling at us uh, while we were doing trekking, and all the women uh, was so strong, even they had cold, sometimes the high altitude sickness. Oh, I'm just, you know, because like I fell like three times today, so I've just had a little fear of the sleepy snow. Oh, just, uh, I've, I've had five bouts of diarrhea this morning, so I had to take some pills, but it's, I, need, I need to go again, but I'm not pulling my pants down out here. <laughs> it's too cold. And they were, all positive and strong to do the Everest Base Camp trekking. Tomorrow, tomorrow, I love ya. Tomorrow is only a day away. Tomorrow, tomorrow, I love ya. Tomorrow is only a day. Are you all? You all right? Everyone all right? Okay, I'm going to give a short briefing about today's walk. Uh, for today, we are going to walk uh, six kilometers from here to base camp. So that will take about uh, five to six hours to get there. Uh, I would like to say to everyone, Please stay positive, stay uh, hopeful, don't be uh, nervous or don't think you can't do it. You, you have come so far, like we have been here for a week. So just today is a top day. We can do it. Everyone is strong enough. Where are we ladies? <laughs> Base camp! I can see the sun! <laughs> Best day of my life. Oh. 
So during our treks, we always encourage our young female guides to share their stories and to explain how far they've come. Um, so they talk a lot about what they've experienced as children and why they've needed support through the charity and what this job means to them. And what comes across strongly is that this job has changed their life. And in many cases, they explain that it has allowed them to continue their education. A lot of them have been able to support their siblings' education. And in some cases, they have been able to support their mother. So um, when Sam and I started Take On Nepal and started employing young women, we knew it would have a big impact, but um, we weren't quite aware just how much it would impact not just on that young woman, but on their families as well. So that, that's something that, uh, that even surprised us. Why do you think it's important that we have the girls take us? Because I think as girls, females, women, we lose our dreams along the way because of life, life gets in the way. So having girls take us actually helps, I don't know, empower women. And it doesn't matter where you are in life, what stage, how old you are. You keep you can keep doing things. What a journey. <laughs> Here you are. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for all your help. <laughs> How do you feel? <laughs> oh, elated. <laughs> Emotional, drained. <laughs> it's naughty. <laughs> oh my god, I've got to go see that sign. <laughs> I can't do it again, it wasn't even that hard. I can't handle my emotions. I'm feeling a bit emotion, emotional in this trip because this is 100% successful trip of my trekking. So I would like to say thank you so much to all the team and I would like, I would like to congratulate all the team members. Here we are. 5,364 meter height above the sea level. Everest Base Camp with Take on, on Nepal. station favourite Andrew Lawboys. We really do enjoy his arrangements of pop songs. Now we don't usually do this, but we have the original song that inspired the piece. This is Just Kate. I'm out. Please enjoy.
Hi. Hi. <clears throat> Hi. I missed you today. Oh no, I just hung out. <laughs> Brad, I should have told you sooner. We're having a baby. <laughs> Sandy! Tell me about it, stud. Tell me about it, stud. Ah. Tell me about it, stud. Speak to me like that. I'm pregnant. Yes, a large, please. I'm eating for two. No, I don't want anchovies. I'm pregnant. Yes, I'll have some cheese, please. I waited for you to come home all day. Brad, I have to tell you something. <sighs> Misa Lobo, bring me Han Solo. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Doing it. Turn it off. Clark, he's playing around. I look gross. Stop it. You look beautiful. Come on. No one will see. Yeah, no one will see until someone does. Oh, I promise. I'll delete it straight away. Come on. Please. Oh. Do you promise? Yes, yes, yes. I promise. I promise.
Hey, babe. You still awake? Mm-hmm. Man, what a night I've had. I'm sorry, but I told a bit of a fib. I didn't want you to worry, but I wasn't working back. I was at the police station all night. It's okay, but that crazy bitch was calling again this morning. She even came to the office at one stage, but you know, she took off before the cops arrived. But it's all good now. It's been sorted, so there's absolutely nothing to worry about. I'm pretty sure we've heard the last of them. Hey, what happened to the photo of us? No, anyway. All I'm gonna do is cuddle up and... Besties!